And we are live. We are all the way live. Awesome. Good morning, everybody. Hi, Shannon. Hey, Dion. How are you? I'm so excited to be talking to you today. Likewise. Likewise. It's going to be a great conversation. Here we are. All right. Let's jump on in, everybody. Shannon and I are big, big uh, fans, for those of you that may have been listening in earlier on time management. And so we want our yes to be yes and our no to be no. And our yes and commitment to everybody here is to stay on time and on track. So thank you for joining us. For those of you, this is part two of our webinar of starting five fundamentals of starting and growing an inside sales team. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had done the first piece where we had started giving some of the framework pieces. And then today we're really going to talk about putting a little bit of meat on that bone. We're going to give you some good how to's, especially, you know, we're September going into October already. Holy cow. So I know we're all gearing up for planning season and all that good stuff. So Shannon and I really want to make sure that you've got some, some really good ideas heading into this, this next season that we're going to go through. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and we'll, we'll just keep going as, as, a, as a webinar to kick it off. If you guys have any questions, if anybody on the call has any questions, please go ahead and use the chat feature. Please connect with Shannon and I on LinkedIn. Follow us on Twitter. Um, there's so many different ways to communicate these days. So pick your, pick your poison as it were. All right. So here's our agenda for today. For those of you that had joined us last time, we're, we're going to be talking about the same five components. We are going to, uh, move more to the how versus the what, which is what we covered in the first webinar. So if you haven't had a chance, go ahead and watch that one again. Shannon, anything to add or did I miss anything? No, I think that's perfect. I would encourage everybody ask us questions in the chat. That's one of the real benefits of joining live. And if you have to drop off early, although we promise to be done by 1230, we will send everybody the recording. Absolutely. All right, let's jump right in with the team structure. We had talked about this in the first one where, you know, a lot of times an organization will say, hey, let's start an inside sales team. And there may or may not be a lot of wisdom that goes along with that decision. And so there's a difference between being smart and being wise, right? So we can all be very book smart, but it's not until we start doing things that we gather wisdom from experience. So as you are going through, if you're starting your inside sales team, please have a plan and have it be crystal, crystal clear. So if you're going to have an inside sales team that's going to do some SDR work, be very clear with the alignment of what the team is doing and how that is driving to the organization's success. So some questions that you may wanna ask yourself as sales generates revenue, let's, let's not kid ourselves here and let's be very, very direct on this wonderful Friday morning and almost afternoon for those of you on the East Coast, right? So there's nothing wrong with making money um, there's everything right with being prosperous in the right way. We don't have to be jerks about it. So, but uh, let's also be clear that generating revenue is the result. It's kind of like a diet. A diet is not the result. A diet is the activity we do to get to the result we need, whether it's lowering blood pressure, sugar counts, weight, size, whatever the case may be, or increasing some certain things. So the questions you need to ask yourself are, these that are here, I'm not going to read them. Everybody can go ahead and take a look at the slide. And so as you are formulating your plan, as you're building your inside sales team, be very, very crystal clear on what exactly you want them to do and make sure those activities align with what the organization is hoping to achieve for its outcome, right? So again, we had talked about this before. There's four roughly um, different ways you can structure your team how your structure your team needs to align with the desired outcome. So if you are looking to fill the funnel, if you've got this awesome inbound engine, you wanna make sure any leads that you're generating inbound get followed up with appropriately, right? And if you're wanting to acquire or reacquire customers, that's a different skill set, right? So what we need to make sure we're doing is, is, is really aligning again. Otherwise we end up like this and we've got a bunch of resources and we still can't get over the hump. So we want to make sure that alignment drives everything at the end of the day. So I'm going to pause and take a breath. We're moving pretty quick. It's, it's nine o'clock here. I've had a lot of coffee. It's going awesome on the, on the West coast. So be brutally honest with yourself. And on a scale of one to 10, 
how would you rate your sales organization's alignments to your company goals? Are you, if your company is a startup, what does that look like? If you're rolling out a new product, that's a different angle. If you're going after a new segment, that's a different angle. Um, if you're an inside sales leader, did you really get all the headcount you needed? And if, and if you did, congratulations, you're on the hook for that. And if you didn't, congratulations, you're still on the hook, right? So it's one of those good, bad things. Um, you know, and ultimately the million dollar question is what are you doing differently this year than last? And as you head into 2019 planning, this question is the one that should definitely keep you up at night because whatever you're doing today, you cannot be doing next year if you want to be successful, especially if you're not into digital selling, or if you give yourself a five on this scale, you know, get to that alignment piece and figure out what needs to be tweaked. At the end of the day, it may be messaging, it may be some tools, it may be um, some training that you need to put in place. So some of those things to consider, give yourself a grade and then take a step back and figure out what the thing, what, what activities need to be different in order to be more successful. All right. There we I go. Know. I love it. I love it. So that is such a great exercise. Thank you, Dion. And for everybody who wrote down your number, revisit it in a month, revisit it in a week and see how are things changing and how can you keep progressing them forward. And one of the ways we're suggesting you do that is with effective job descriptions. So we have a poll running. We've had a lot of people vote already, which is great, on how many of you are starting or growing a team. And it looks like we've got, you know, about 60% who are interested in exploring or who have everything ready and are ready to launch. And then we've got about 40% of people who have started the team but are looking to expand or are working on best practices okay. and so this job description piece will fall into either category regardless of where you are you know when you're looking at job descriptions and you're looking at how you can scale effectively mm -hmm. as we've passed the what stage and moved to the how and why we want to make sure that you have measurable results on the back end so that you can really fix them as you go and with and unemployment is so low right now and you guys know that that is a pain for every organization yeah. when unemployment is so low it's the employees market yeah. so you want to make sure that your job descriptions are speaking to what you want them to that they're describing your organization as a best place to work and you want those people who are on the other side of the table at a job fair or at an interview to say yes this is my employer of choice and that's where they start with your your job description mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. absolutely yeah. So when we're looking at the ideal profile of an inside salesperson, and we have talked a lot about hiring for character and training skill, because that can be done. And I love it. And I know Dion loves it. We both have launched inside sales teams from scratch. And when you find the right person with the right attitude, that is great. You can teach them the things that they need to do, how to enter into CRM, how to make prospecting calls, how to do research. Mm -hmm. If you've got the right attitude, that part's going to be really easy for you. So that's Absolutely. one of the things we really want you to consider as you're continuing to roll out your inside sales team. And Absolutely. That, Make sure that, that when, you're, when you're thinking about all of the things they have access to, be willing to help them understand that multi-mode approach. Right, Dion? Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. So we are looking at, you know, the old inside sales, which people, you know, used to call telemarketing, which actually makes my heart hurt. Oh. Um, <laughs> And people are like, smile and dial, smile and dial. And that is not what we're looking at now. And we're mm. talking about inside sales, SDRs, BDRs, anybody who is sitting in the sort of capacity, who is excellent at communication, who's got a really great ability to build relationships, who's skilled at social media, and who has a very open mindset. Those are the types of people that you're looking for and your job description should reflect those things. Mm -hmm. well. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So when we're looking at the four key pillars of our people success, we want to give you a little bit of context to make sure that you have the right people in the seat before you start their training. Mm -hmm. and, and this is a constant process. This is not a one-time event. You don't bring them in, indoctrinate them, throw some baptismal water on their head and call it a day. You know, you want to look at that job description as your calling card, which represents your brand and you as the hiring manager and say, 
You know, who do I want to work for you? Who can round out my team? Do I have a talent pipeline so that as my people get promoted and move on inside of my organization, I have somebody ready just in time so that I don't lose any time meeting my quotas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is a great example we wanted to share with you as a job description that is exciting, that tells about your company, because as these job candidates are really shopping, this is what their first impression is. Do they even want to apply to your job? So make sure it's exciting, make sure that it's real and realistic, make sure it's about the company that you are, and then tell them what's in it for them. Because frankly, whenever you're interviewing somebody, it's as much do they fit into my culture as them saying, is this a culture I want to fit into? Mm-hmm. Yep. So our next steps for you, this is just like the exercise Dion gave you at the end of the first step is benchmark your current job description. So look at your current job description and read it through the eyes of an applicant and say, is this something that I would want to do? And identify those areas of improvement. Just highlight them, underline them, look for ways that you can fix them and determine your plan and then implement it. Just do it. Work with the person in HR, or if you're the one who's doing all the hiring yourself, just do it. And one of the things we talk about a lot where Dion and I really meet in the middle is making sure that perfection is never the enemy of progress. So continue to be iterative and keep making sure that that job description is the calling card that you want it to be. Give yourself a mark right now on a scale of one to 10 on your little piece of paper on how you would rate your overall recruitment and retention efforts both on your job description and your own personal networking as a hiring manager. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause at the end of the day, people either want to work for you or not with you. So yeah, that's a great recap, Shannon. And again, with inside sales growing with a, the labor market, the way it is right now, it is an employee's market and we need to do everything we can to make ourselves, our company, our roles, um, the, the most attractive they can be to those candidates, right? And we want the right people on, on, the, on our team. So with that, as we think about putting all this effort into our structure and what we want our teams to do and really driving that alignment, and then we talk about, okay, now that we know what exactly what we're looking for, we can create our ideal candidate profile. If you have an ideal customer profile, you definitely need to have an ideal candidate profile. If you don't, that should be one of the first things you do is make sure you've got that alignment. And then from there, now that you've got these folks on, we just spent a tremendous amount of effort and time and money to put, put the right show out there. And now we've got these people coming back to us and we need to, as Shannon said, throw the baptismal water on them and make it stick at the end of the day. So we had definitely talked about onboarding and training before. We've got our job description, a revenue stream, we're interviewing, we're networking, we're onboarding, we're training, and it's really about assimilation, guys. It's, it's, there's an organization I was talking to and they have a reputation. They are known for their excellent customer experience. And they wanna start an outbound inside sales team. And we've all been on the receiving end of cold calls, right? So their biggest thing is how do we do this and not lose our brand reputation in the marketplace? They are very aligned, right? And it's something that we all should be. So if you're an organization that cares about your brand in the market or whatever the case may be, I think you all understand where we're going with that analogy. So as you're going through this, if you do not have an onboarding plan, I encourage you strongly to have a plan. She who has no plan has no future of success. He who has no plan has no team that knows the destination. So make it part of your hiring strategy because I, I will bet you dollars to donuts that your new hires are coming in going, what's your onboarding and training plan? Everybody's asking that question nowadays. And if you don't have an answer, you're not going to win the best talent. So people want to know that you care as much about their success as they do at the end of the day. So this is just part of not only initial onboarding, I encourage you to think of it more as a continuous learning cycle within your organization. I put together this table in word literally within minutes. 
So if you are an inside sales leader um, and you have, don't have an onboarding plan yet, don't overthink it. Chances are, if you're coming at this with, with, with enough experience, you can probably do that high level piece and then retroactively, like Shanna was saying, go back in and measure and make adjustments, but don't let perfection be the enemy of getting stuff done and progress. Same thing with, with training, right? So if you are an organization that has a mission statement and a vision statement and your key tenants, your CEO is walking that walk and talking that talk, whether they're out on webinars, they're doing road shows, they're on Fox News, they're asking investors for money, whatever words the CEO is using in his or her presentation, your entire sales team needs to be using in the conversations they're having with their prospects. If they're not, your sales team is out of alignment. So now revisit this on a scale of one to 10, how aligned is your sales organization to the company's mission? And think about to the sales calls that you've listened to in the last little bit. Are you hearing words? Are you hearing your sales team use words that your CEO would use or words that are found in your company mission and vision statement? If they're not, again, you're out of alignment. You should probably go to zero at that point. <laughs> so, because really we're the blind leading the blind, right? And that's not a knock on folks that, that are blind. This is, a fo this is a knock on those of us in a leadership role that haven't provided the tools and technology and training to our team in order to get them on the right path and drive that alignment. So here's that checklist for you. At the end of the day, your onboarding, your training, your continuous learning improvement, for those of us that have never worked for a large organization, if you're the sales leader in this, in this regard, this is on you. And again, it's either something that you can do in-house or you can go outside to do. But at the end of the day, not having onboarding and training and continuous learning isn't an option anymore. It's something, it's a table stake, quite frankly, at this stage of the game. So we want to provide that, um, that you are here dot for folks. And so again, everybody's got homework. This is the third one we're doing, right? So really, really benchmark yourself on a scale of one to 10. How effective is your company's onboarding? So on average, the inside sales rep ramps three to four months, meaning they, they've ramped to full quota carrying. If that's not the case, something is out of alignment. How effective is your company's ongoing sales training from a consistency perspective? Are your weekly sales meetings, um, are they data dumps from you or product marketing or whoever, or are they actual training sessions where the team talks among themselves, to themselves, shares best practices, right? At some point, the sales meeting and sales training, we need to get out of the way and let our team talk with each other and share what works. So that's the deal. It's such a good point, Dion. And one of the things we really want to encourage everybody who's on the call is to continue to make those assessments, not only for their team, but also for their, their selves. So we want to talk to you. Our fourth point is really about leadership and coaching. And one of the things Dion says all the time, which I do actually quote, is keep it simple and be specific. And a lot of you probably been trained on SMART goals. We want to talk about things that are time bound, that are measurable, that are actionable. And really, one of the things we're focused on is the difference between a boss and a leader. So a manager, they manage the process and they don't provide any more value. They just do as they're told and they just keep dragging things forward. And a leader helps to make changes for the better by evaluating that golden triangle, the people, the process, and the technology. And we're going to share this link with you afterwards on managing versus leading and why they're different. And so one of the things that we really want to help you focus on is to remember it's not about you. Once you become a leader and you've all heard about this drive towards servant leadership, it's not about you anymore. It's about making your team successful. So consider how you do that and what a day-to-day -day looks like for your team, for yourself, how you can continue to empower them so that they can do the things that they need to do to meet their goals and quotas, which in turn will help you to meet your goals and quotas, which is definitely the name of game and when you're in sales. And so when you look at this sort of spoken wheel and you see that good leader in the middle and all of these attributes around it, these competencies, how do we provide recognition and encouragement? How do we set a good example and how do we provide clear goals? When you're thinking about those things, 
consider the aspect of managing down and managing up and understanding one, how you can tell your team, this is what I do. These are the things that I do. And these are the things that you do and how I can help you with those things. And that will help you to set the tone in terms of your leadership and coaching style. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I think one of the things that, that we wanted to provide you here was just a little checklist because a lot of times when we move into a leadership role, it's because we were an A player ourselves. So we see this a lot of times. You were a great salesperson and now you're going to be managing a team and your day is totally different. So some of the things you have to think about if you're a new leader, things you should reflect on if you've been a leader is you need to manage and own up while also leading down. You have to collaboratively work across departments. You're no longer living in just this little sales silo. You have to worry about your friends and operations and marketing and Mm. finance and motivating your team and helping them to keep their process up to date, especially in sales because we're so technology focused now. As technology changes, our use changes of it. So making sure that your policies and procedures are up to date continuous training, constant training. And one of the things I love to do um, as I manage inside sales teams was during our monthly meetings to say, you now, you Susie, you're in charge of leading us this week and teaching us something that you learned or read about a webinar you attended or an article that, that you found and helping them to measure success and make incremental adjustments. Do not, do not, we implore you, don't wait until that annual review to tell them here's something you could do better. Make sure that you are constantly giving them feedback and making small tweaks and improvements because in sales, we live by 90 day years, don't we? So we can't wait for that annual review and then help them to be known by their peers in the industry. So give them those opportunities to stand in front, have them help you fill your pipeline, really encourage them to continue to build their cadre and make their network even bigger. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then I think, you know, when we're looking at um, inside sales by the number, we know that the number one top challenge for all sales leaders, inside sales, field sales, sales engineers, it's training and development. We want to hire those A players and assume they're coming in so well trained, they're going to be motivated by their money and we don't have to train them at all. And we've all seen that little cartoon that says, what happens if we train them and they leave? And the other side says, What happens if we don't and they stay? And so when we're looking at all of the literature out there, AISP in their top challenges report and trends over the past so many years have said 70% of managers account for the employees variance and engagement. So we want to make sure we set aside the time to properly train and focus our team so that they know exactly what they're being held accountable to, what they're responsible for. And and I think that's going to really help us to push our coaching. We know this, Dion. Everybody says bad people don't leave bad companies, they leave bad managers. And I think when we look at that from the leadership aspect, people want to be encouraged and motivated. And especially now as we've got millennials and Gen Z coming into the market, they're really really interested in a sense of purpose. And so if you can help them to find that, drive them to it, they want to do their best every day. And so when you're looking at how you can become a good leader, you're also part of their people. Let's help them to understand what we can do for them, how we can make their days better and make their whole entire employment experience something that really matters to them. Absolutely. Absolutely. We've given you here a sort of basic example agenda that you can use for your one-on-ones and please do not ever, ever, ever cancel them. Once you cancel them, you're saying to your employees, something else is more important than you were. So keep your agenda, make sure that you're covering quantitative and qualitative things. So what is their goal to quota? What activities have they had? And then start to talk to them about what went well. And this managing by, by example is also something that we can't take for granted. Yeah. Absolutely. So we're providing you also with this training and coaching calendar. This is something that we take very seriously. And Dion and I are totally aligned on this. So make sure that you have something that people can count on and you're not constantly shifting your calendar and you're saying, I take training seriously. I'm putting this in my calendar and we are going to stick to it. So Mm -hmm. you can set something up like this for yourself, for your team and let them know, hey, Mm -hmm. whenever we're having our training and coaching, let's all be there. Absolutely. 
And then finally, um, in this category, which is our fourth step, is our next steps and resources are for you to think about why you decided to become a sales leader, how you can continually lead in that aspect, keep your motivations going, write them down for yourself so you can refer to them on the really hard days, and consider what you should start doing, what you should stop doing, things that you've done in the past that you might want to bring back, and think about the type of leader that really encouraged you, the type of leader that made you say, yes, I want to do my best work for this person, and what type of modeling activities you can put into your own day. And don't forget about those training, coaching, and one-on-one calendar. Leave those on your calendars. Don't change them. We've got a couple of uh, resources and references here for you that we'll share after the webinar that you can use. And one of the other things we want to talk about is creating your own advisory team. So have that board of directors for yourself that will tell you, hey, it's time for you to step back and consider the way this is coming across. Absolutely. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Shannon, such good points with that. And I think... There's a really great book called Extreme Ownership uh, by Jocko Willink and Leif Babin, uh, retired Navy SEALs. They're, they're kind of, um, a lot of folks have heard about them. I think I was maybe late to that game and they definitely talk about that, that extreme ownership, um, which is just so many good points. And, and really the fifth piece we're gonna talk about here and we're gonna go pretty quick so we can end on time for everybody is the reporting. And as long as we have our first piece of alignment with our team structure, then we've got further alignment, which drives to our job description and the people, our ideal uh, candidate profile, which then drives down into um, our training and our onboarding. And then we talk about our leadership competency piece. And then we now talk about the reporting piece at the end of the day. And it, think about it from just, again, one continuous circle at the end of the day, everybody. Um, when we have the right purpose and goal and motivation in place, it removes ambiguity from the system. If anywhere in your process, you have anything that says, oh, that's at the manager's discretion, it needs to be weeded out today and replaced with a systemized, very objective approach. Because reporting is all about data and we want to save our subjective conversations for call coaching, um, demo coaching. We do not want anything in our system or our processes that can be nailed down, quite frankly. So ambiguity just breeds mistrust. And next thing you know, everybody's focus is on why is Johnny Jack joke and then leads and Susie isn't. Really, is that, is that the conversation we wanna be having today? Or is the conversation we wanna be having today on the first day of the month is, all right, everybody, we're in a SAS model, we've got a monthly number to make, who's committed to making their number by the 15th? Those are the conversations you wanna be having, not the marketing send me leads and they're terrible. So-and-so is getting leads and I'm not. How do I get promoted? How do you, right? So we wanna make sure that this is a, a an, um, a dashboard example that's coming from predictable revenue. I think it's definitely more for the SDR side of the house, but again, it's alignment. So whatever widgets are on your boards, your dashboards, and I encourage you, I would have my sales teams always start their day from a dashboard and drill down because you want them reverse engineering their day. So have whatever is showing on your reps dashboards, what is the most important? It's how they get paid, it's how they determine success, it's how they know what skill they need to work on. Here's another example of a dashboard. Um, again, dials, conversations, super simple. Everybody knows what they need to be doing in order to be successful, how they get paid. If these things are in the red, they know they need to go and start coaching. So if your dashboards are not reflective of your reps, literally, and that's what a dashboard is, guys. It's a red, yellow, green. You do not go up to a, a stop and go light and it's purple, right? It's very clear. So your dashboards need to provide that same clarity to your sales team at the end of the day. So if your reps, look at the dashboards from your reps perspective, can they look at this and know beyond a shadow of a doubt they're doing okay or they're behind? Same thing for you, because at the end of the day, we all have to report to finance and finance or some CEO, right? Like, why are my salespeople getting paid this much? And you need to have a defensible position. Otherwise, your people are going to exit. So for 
all the right reasons for clarity, for execution, for success, for hitting goals, for working on skill development, your dashboards drive that behavior at the end of the day. It's kind of the icing on the cake. So benchmark your current dashboards, guys. Your fifth and final piece of the homework, right, is, whoops, sorry guys, I'm going too fast, is, is really benchmark your dashboards. Are they driving the behavior the success that you want at the end of the day. If they are, fantastic, great. That's not something you have to tackle right now. But if they're not, mm, I would definitely put that down as a 2019 initiative that is, is not negotiable at the end of the day. So thank you. So those are your five pieces of homework, right? Is definitely to measure yourself. Um, we have some resources for you. These are some great books. If you have any others that you'd like to share, I'm always looking for kind of the next book or podcast or whatever to take a look at. So by all means, feel free to take a look at these as well as share what you got. And a little bit about us and I'll leave it to Shannon to, to wrap us up. So thank you so much, Dion. As always, an absolute joy and pleasure. I just so enjoy speaking inside sales with you. And I know the Likewise. future is continuing to be strong. Research keeps telling us that inside sales profession is going to grow by 300%. So this is super important. So everybody who's on the call, I will tell you, find me or Dion or both of us on Twitter, on LinkedIn. We love to talk inside sales. So let us know, did we leave anything out? Anything else we can help fill in for you? And yep. we are going to thank you for coming today. And Dion, I love it. As always, you're my inspiration. Likewise. Thank you, Shannon. Appreciate it. Thank you all for joining today. Thanks, everybody.